Hi, I've been working quite a bit on Rust tool recently again, and um, I want to show some of the new features that I have implemented. I think the most notable one are the improvements in logging. So at the developer page, you have um, the real-time data logging as usual, and it looks like it did before, but they have added a lot of new values to it. You cannot see them under help yet, unfortunately, but I will just show the CSV file open on my computer quickly. And uh, before I think we had something like 14 different values and now I think we have around 55. So lots of different log data entries that you can use for different, uh, for analysis, uh, analyzing different aspects of um, rights for two setups. So what we didn't have before in this log is uh, GNSS data. So we have the longitude and latitude and height and how fast we're going according to the uh, GPS. And we also have IMU data, so roll, pitch, and yaw, and uh, how, how much acceleration and angular ve velocity we had during the ride. Now, when it comes to the practicality of logging, we also have some uh, quite significant improvements. The first thing is that before you would have to have a vast tool running and in the front and the screen on on Android in order to log it all. If you would close it down, it would uh, pause the logging until you open it again. So now there is a new setting under settings called the uh, use wake lock. And this means that it will keep the CPU alive. And even if you close vast tool and also if you switch off the screen, it will keep logging in the background. Now what it doesn't do in the background yet is logging GPS data. I think I know how to fix that. I think I have to add a notification to Android to the activity area in order to keep that going. But for now, you will have to, you can, for example, work around that by installing a different app that keeps the GPS alive and uh, doing a quick search on Google Play. I tried this one called the GPS Keeper and running this one at the same time as studio logging, you can log everything, including the GPS data, even when the screen is off and we have the phone in the pocket. If you don't have something like this running, then it will log data, but it will not get any GPS positions. Now, the thing I probably spent the most time on during this release is uh, not logging itself, but the uh, analysis of log data. And if you go to VESC tool, I have added a log analysis page under the data analysis section where you can open those log files. In order to open them, you have to move them to your computer. I think in the future I will implement something on the website where you can do that um, a bit easier. But for now, you will have to plug in a USB cable and move it over to the computer or email them or something like that. Regarding the log files, I also want to mention that uh, every time you enable logging, and disable it, it will create a new file with the current date and time. So if you're out riding and you want to log different sections, you can just toggle this box every time you want to create a new file where you start logging data. So I have one log that I did the other day running around in my, in my neighborhood on a uh, scooter, an electric scooter that I built recently. And it looks like this. So first you can see that we have an uh, open street map here where the log is loaded. And uh, down here you have a timeline where you can click and you can scroll, scroll around on the log. And as you do that, let me make this one a bit bigger. You have a bunch of values here or almost all of the values that were stored in the CSV file that I showed before. And as you drag, they will be updated. What you also can do is you can um, click on the values and then this timeline, which is actually is a plot, will plot the value during this time and you can drag around and see what it was for the different sections of the track. And you can select as many values if, as you want. The only ones that you cannot select are the time values because they are the same as the x-axis. And it would make sense because then you just get a 45 degree line. And here, for example, we have a uh, a log with uh, the GNS speed and the speed measured by the VASC. And they are surprisingly similar. Now we see in the beginning that the GNS speed was lagging behind a bit because we have some latency. But for some reason, I think it 
caught up after a while and they were almost in phase. And you can also see that the VASC speed is updated more often. So the, on Android, as far as you can tell, you can only log at one hertz, so one sample per second. And at the current log settings, you could get about six or seven samples per second. So for every GPS sample, which is in the plot, you get like six or seven VASC samples in between with all the data values. Another thing you can do here is you can use this bar down here. So this will let you select which portion of the log we want to study. So now we have selected the whole one. So if you take, for example, the slider on the right side and drag it to the left, you can see that we cut it off from the end of the log. I started here and went around like this. And likewise, we can take the one on the left side and move it to the right. And this is useful for one thing if we want to have a smaller piece of data visible here on the graph. But also if you go to the stats tab here, then those statistics here are kind of average values over the portion of the ride that you're looking at right now. And uh, for example, if you want to look at the efficiency of many watt hours per kilometer, you could study, for example, an uphill section or something like that and see how it performed exactly there. And you can also get um, like how many amp hours and watt hours is on you used for that particular section and how many samples you have uh, available there. Another way to navigate around on the log is you could click on the map. So if you can, if you select any of the values and click on it, the map will move to that one, both on the data stream here and uh, on the graph here. Another thing I want to show about the values here is that you have the ones that you can plot also have this plot scale value. Now, if you have uh, two values that have roughly the same magnitude, you don't really need to change it. But suppose uh, you want to plot uh, the IMU data or the acceleration together with those. This one has a range of 0 to 40 or so because that's how fast I was going. But, but the acceleration is uh, significantly smaller. It has something like uh, around a couple of Gs. So if it's like this one together with the speed, this one gets almost completely drowned out because the amplitude is so low. And then, for example, you could either decrease the amplitude here on the speed to make this one more significant, or you can also go down to this one and increase the amplitude here. What I usually do is I only hold the mouse over the value and scroll, because then it will not deselect anything. So let's make the acceleration a bit bigger. And actually want to study the C acceleration, so let's do that. And the reason we want to look at C is that uh, this one gives the most uh, um, indication when you go over bumps. And that's a bit interesting because here, for example, when I have a bit of more of an uh, indication here, this is an asphalt, but here I know that there is a speed bump. And I know there is another speed bump over here somewhere. And uh, this spike here is most likely where that speed bump is. And uh, then there is also here, when I went uh, on the street here and went into a smaller wind for forest, then we have a small bump when I enter that one. So you can see where all the bumps were. Now, since we only have a uh, low sample rate, we have uh, 6.7 Hertz in this case. The accelerator values are quite, uh, well, you get quite a bit of aliasing because you might have big spikes that you simply miss completely. But I think in the future I might make something that kind of averages them between the samples and this, those values might be a bit more accurate. Another thing you can do here is you can look at the IMU data. And here you will see a 3D picture of the VASC. And if you plot this one together with the, the roll pigeon yaw, you can see, let's study the green one for example which is the yaw value, and this one should correspond to where we're going. You can also mention that this 3D picture of the VASC, the reason that it is uh, angled and sitting like this, is that the VASC on the scooter is mounted uh, kind of at 45 degrees on the bar that goes between uh, where I have the feet and the handlebar. So that's why it's not sitting flat. You can also adjust uh, uh, for that in the IMU page that I might show later. So if you drag here, you can see the, the ride how the VASC moves around. And here, for example, where we have a long flat line, this is when we were on this uh, straight section here. 
Another thing you might notice when you're zoomed in and you go away, maybe you want to follow this dot and you can just click follow up here and then you will follow this one as you scroll on the map. And you can also, if you go closer, if you want to measure distances, you can also activate the grid and then you can get the grid that updates depending on the zoom level. And here, for example, we have five meters per uh, square. So from here to here, there are five meters. That can also be a bit useful. Another thing to mention here is that uh, you probably saw it that we also have the, in addition to the VESC values, we have the GNSS values. And I was asked about this because there are a couple of people who use this VESC 75-300 on hydrofiles and underwater. You cannot really get the VESC speed uh, accurately because you don't have any wheels that roll on the ground. So then you can uh, use the GNSS speed, GNSS speed for uh, analysis. And uh, like the speed, there's also a distance that is calculated between the samples. I just go between them and calculate the straight line between each two samples. And this way you can get the distance along the ride, how far you've been going. And also statistics. So you can see the whole length of the ride here. One interesting thing here is that uh, the GNSS length and the length by, measured by the VASC are almost the same. I mean, they're 0.5% apart. So I think I got the... Uh, wheel diameter measurement quite accurate on the scooter and I just did it with a ruler quickly so it's quite easy to get um, maybe I was lucky but for me it was quite easy to get that correct uh, distance and speed measurement by just getting the correct gearing, gearing ratio and uh, wheel diameter. Another thing I control quickly in the VASC tool is that the IMU page has been updated so if you connect to the VASC um, we see the and activate IMU sampling. We have roll pitch and yaw, and those raw values as usual. And we also have the 3D plot. Now, this is connected over Bluetooth. We can try to connect over USB instead, and we can get it a bit smoother because we get higher sample rate. Let's see. So, this is quite convenient for seeing what orientation you have of the VASC. And this will be useful later for the, cell, uh, the self balancing unicycle app that uh, was uh, contributed recently to the VESC source. I also got the unicycle for myself. I will see if I can start manage to ride it, but for now I haven't really tried it yet. Another thing that might be useful that I also added to VESC tool to the mobile version, uh, jumping bit forth and back is a TCP server. I think it was running before. So if you're connected on the phone to a VASC and your phone is connected to a Wi-Fi at home, for example, and your computer is connected to the same network, then you can start a TCP server in VASC tool. And when you start this one, it will show you which IP addresses your phone has. And in this case, I have this one. And then you can go to the connection page of VASC tool and do TCP and connect to this one over the network and then you can have your phone connected to the desk somewhere else and uh, access this from the desktop version which could be quite useful in some cases and uh, finally i have added uh, an updated version for under svd programming for the uh, west wand so there's a new one for firmware out there it has uh, some a bit important updates. One of them is that uh, the one could freeze on occasions. Uh, that was apparently because I was using I'm using the Zephyr OS on it. I will publish the source code for it soon, by the way, as soon as I polish it a bit more. And in Zephyr, you cannot use floating point numbers in an interrupt for some reason, and I think that was the reason. But it was really hard to replicate this freeze. I don't even know if it even was that because. Uh, I didn't experience it once, even once during development, and now I had the one day connected to my power supply for like three days, and during that time I managed to get it to freeze once, so I think that was the issue. So that the fix, and just to be sure, I also added a watchdog to it. The other thing I added to one firmware is that uh, I did uh, to the sampling of the joystick, the pot potentiometer on it, I added uh, quite a few tricks to detect if the potentiometer is bad or if you got a banned sample. Namely, I have added uh, 
you can on the NRF you can activate the pull ups and pull down resistors on the pins at the same time as you have the ADC running. So now I'm taking one sample with the pull down, one with the pull up, and one without any pull resistor, and look at the differences between them to figure out if the impedance is high right now. And if the impedance is high on the ADC input, then there's probably some problem with the joystick, and then we'll just ignore the sample and use the previous one. And this works well because joysticks, they're usually, or potentiometers, when they have when they are bad, they usually have very distinct regions that are bad, and that means that when you were about to enter that region, you just had a good sample before that. So even if you miss a few samples, the previous value will probably be where you are, more or less. And if you miss too many samples in a row, then it will show an error message on the screen and slowly move the throttle back to the neutral position. And I think this is a quite good addition. I've been making many remotes before and I think in one of them I had a problem where the joystick was not that good and it was jumping. So now I'm a bit more confident that when, when I get a weird impedance on it, then it will uh, handle that in a safe way. So that's all the updates I had for now. Uh, thanks for watching.